Welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk about the first match they ever attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, Adam Somerton. Adam started his broadcasting career over 20 years ago, got plenty of experience in both radio and television. He's one of the main commentators for TNT alongside fellow podcast guest, Darren Fletcher, who kicked off this whole series with episode one. Adam covers a range of football from Champions League, Premier League, WSL, and even European leagues such as Serie A and Ligue 1. Uh, Adam also heads up, heads up TNT's National League coverage. So anyway, Adam, welcome to the show. And I know your Thanks. first game was when you were pretty young. And we will only touch on this briefly because you probably don't have very clear memories before moving on to some landmark games. Yeah, no, I, well, I think, um, I'm not certain because it could have been at Hague Avenue because I, I come originally from Southport, so it could have been there. But my first memory I have of going to a game was uh, Liverpool-Southampton in October 1985. And I always remember Peter Shilton was in goal. I always remember that for Southampton. Um, and I think it was Steve McMahon who got the only goal of the game. So, I mean, the Liverpool side, I've, I've actually looked back at it Mm -hmm. um, ahead of this and obviously it's pretty star-studded Kenny Dalglish was there Ian Rush was there and funnily yeah. enough actually two of the players who started that day for Liverpool I actually ended up working with in as a commentator uh, Phil oh, Neal right. yeah Phil Neal who I did um, a Premier League there used to be something called Premier League Radio that was done at IMG um, and the first game I ever did there was with Phil Neal uh, and then subsequently, I've done a lot of games with Jim Beglin, who um, who lives, uh, I'm pretty certain still lives in Southport, actually. He's a um, great guy, Jim. We've been on some European trips together as well. So, yeah, it's really weird that I did that age five and then have gone yeah. on to work with a couple of the players who started that day. Exactly. So, yeah, as a five-year-old, you were saying, right, that guy, that right back's definitely someone I want to work with, that left back. <laughs> you you picked him way. early, Adam. You, it's you weird the way life like, works. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and as I said, we I have dug out the program for you, That's amazing. which wow. which Brilliant. will be working its way over to you uh, after you so this podcast. But interestingly, in this program is something that I didn't realise. So in Kenny Dalglish's notes, because obviously he was the player manager at the time, he talks about the fact they played Southampton a couple of weeks before. In okay, ready for this, listeners. The Screen Sport Super Cup, which Adam and I briefly discussed before this uh, recording. We had no idea, no memory, no memory. whatsoever. Um, clearly it was there because English clubs had, had been removed from Europe because of the Heisel uh, disaster earlier this year. Um, but it, it's also very interesting to see because this is October, okay, um, in in the notes, they say that you know you don't you don't rely on twelve players anymore. We've used fifteen players in quarter of a season as if it was some sort of massive expansion. Uh, it also shows the league table. A Man United had played eleven, won ten, drawn one, so they were on thirty one points. Whereas Liverpool, who is in, who are in second were on 21 points. So this was a Man United who were blazing a trail, looked like they were going to win the league. They didn't win the league. Liverpool won the league. Not only did they win the league, pipping Everton, not only did they beat Everton in the FA Cup, but guess who they beat in the Screen Sport Super Cup final? Yep, it was Everton over two legs. So, yeah, lovely, lovely little things in here. There's also a profile of Alan Hansen, who'd just been made captain. Uh, and it says there in the profile, he isn't a handyman. Um, so that's we now know about Hansen. Now he's, apparently he's very conservative with his choice of clothes. But a golfer. <laughs> a very, and funnily enough, the picture in here is him playing golf. Uh, and I'm yeah. sure he's pretty good on uh, the fairways and greens. Uh, so... As a five-year-old, that is Anfield must be an amazing place to go to for a five-year-old. Was, was there anything sort of washed over you, and you thought, "Wow, this is this is pretty massive"? 
Yeah, I think that the abiding memory that I have, as I say, I don't remember much at all from it, but the abiding yeah. memory is something that I've, I'm very lucky, I suppose, in a way that I've always held on to it because I kind of still get this feeling, not the same as I did when I was a kid, but I do still get that feeling when you walk up the steps of the ground, maybe one that you've never been to before and you see the pitch and you sort of get those almost like tingles, if you like. And that that's what I first remember is in terms of, I remember filming my own children when they went to their first game and walked up the steps and, and saw a pitch because um, just seeing that, I don't know, it's just a magical feeling. And I've always kind of held on to it. I still get it now when I go, I mean, recently I went to the um, refurbished Bernabeu and we're lucky that we can go the day before the game and have a look round. And I walked down the tunnel and, and walked out and it was it was almost that same feeling. You know, when you just look around, you're awestruck yeah. and it's, it's abs- I'm getting goosebumps actually talking about it. It's, it's just so good. And that's, that is kind of what I remember most actually is is just that feeling of, of of walking up the steps and seeing that lush green pitch and of course at the at the big grounds they have that slope on them don't they for the drainage mm. at grounds like Anfield and Old Trafford and, and places like that you, you, it's really noticeable at those grounds. Um, I'm sure they have them at all, but I, I remember the note. I think I remember saying to my dad, "Why why is it sort of sloped?" Um, so yeah, I can remember that too. I think <laughs> I always remember my mum saying because we got the train me and my dad that day. And my mum said that when she saw us walking back up the street after the game, she said she thought my dad had been in a fight because I think um, when when something happened, he'd lifted me up to see, and I'd kind of flown my arms out and and caught him right. in the, his glasses and he cut <laughs> it cut him there. And she said, "I thought your dad had been in a fight or something." So <laughs> mum always re- re- recalls that story. But uh, yeah, I was very young, very young that day. Yeah. Five, I think. Well, at least your dad will remember the game, won't he, with the cut over his eyebrow? Yeah, he did. He always remembered that, yeah. Um, yeah, it would have been special for him, I suppose, to take me there because he was from from Heighton in Liverpool. So I I wasn't. Yeah. I, was, I was brought up in Southport. But yeah, it was... Um, yeah, a day that I've got a hazy memory of, but the overriding one is, is, is that's walk up the steps and the pitch. Yeah, definitely. And so was your dad a Liverpool fan then? Yeah, uh, my, to be honest, my family's really mixed because uh, my granddad was an Everton fan. He was a Liverpool fan. I've got my, one of my granddads was a Manchester United fan. So yeah, it's very mm. mixed in very mixed in my because I'm coming from the northwest. Um, yeah, it was family. Some family from Lancashire, some family from Merseyside. Yeah, so a real mixed bag. Makes uh, family Christmases interesting, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 did you? <laughs> you know, when there's a Boxing Day game, Man United Liverpool or Man United Everton would have put something uh, on the table, as they say. Yeah, yeah looking at the at the teams, because obviously you can track down the lineups and your future colleagues, Beglin and Neil, but it was, well, I mean, they were in their prime pretty much. So you had Grobelar, Lawrence and McMahon, as you say, who scored the goal, Mulby. Walk, Whelan, Johnson, Doug Leach and Rush. I mean, there isn't really a chink in that, is there? It yeah. is a, a great team. And Southampton, as you say, Peter Shilton and Gold, obviously, you know, a very um, well-decorated England international. But then you also have some interesting players in there. So you've got Mark Wright, who would go on to play for Liverpool sort of five or six years later. And then you've also got Jimmy Case, yeah. who had been at Liverpool in his prime and actually moved on to Southampton at the end of his career. And I quite like, you know, you talked about Jim Beglin and Phil Neal. There is always some sort of connection, I find, with particularly with commentators, actually. Their first games, usually there's someone who crops up later in their life, you know, Beglin sitting next to you, Neil sitting next to you. And, and that is one of the joys of football, I think, is that these yeah. connections... They might be, you know, submerged for 20 years, but suddenly they come back. And and uh, it sort of, it gives you a pattern of your life in football, which I think is really fascinating. Do you, do you have those sort of resonances when suddenly someone crops up who's yeah. been involved with you earlier as well as Beglin and Neil? Yeah, it's funny uh, because recently I, I went, I mentioned that trip to Real Madrid and I went with Steve McManaman um, who it was great going to Madrid with Steve McManaman, by the way. <laughs> go, yes. Go, go, take, took us out to one of the restaurants he used to go to when he was a player there. And you can imagine the service we got was, was pretty top notch. Yes. Um, very popular guy still there. But even that was strange because Steve and I had got off 
the plane and got onto the bus that was ferrying us over to the terminal. And we got talking about, because it was the weekend or the week before the League Cup final this season, which Liverpool won. Yeah. And I said, it's it's funny, I was just thinking about the League Cup final. And I remembered back to when Steve had been playing, well, I think they called it the Steve, the Matt Maddaman Cup final when he played against Bolton, when Jason McAteer was at Bolton. Mm-hmm. Um, I think John McGinley was in that team as well. As well. I think... I, I might be wrong here, but I think it was 3-1 to Liverpool. Wembley. I could be wrong there, but I know Liverpool won it. And I remember watching that too. And I said to Steve, like, <laughs> it's just, I'm thinking about next weekend and, and you just cropped into my head. And I remember you basically won a cup final there on your own. He was outstanding that day. So yeah, it's, it is weird the way things come back and you, you might, you know, somebody that you've watched or somebody that you worked with years ago, you sort of, I mean, so what, even last night I was working with F. Anakoku and, I hadn't mm-hmm. seen him in years and we just did a game together and it's like you've, you know, you've it was like it was yesterday that you'd last seen each other. So yeah, it is really weird how life works. I, I have that thought quite a lot, actually. Yeah. Funny you should mention Evan and Koku, because this week's uh episode is with Chris Sutton. And Sutton obviously played with F and Koku and remembers very clearly the first European game for Norwich when they'd finished third in the uh, inaugural Premier League. Their first European game was against Vitesse Arnhem, which Sutton remembers very clearly because F. Nakoku was apparently brilliant and scored a couple of goals. And he talks about him as the perfect foil because you could flick the ball on, as Sutton did. And F. Nakoku is so quick, it doesn't matter where it went, he'd pick it up. So it's, it's quite a nice partnership to have. And uh, again, all these things, they, they come around to it. So Having gone as a five-year-old, was that some sort of special treat or, or did you start to go regularly with your dad? How, how did that work, your no. sort of early years in football watching? No, it didn't start to go no. regularly, no. It was it was more of a treat. And as I say, I'd go to Hague Avenue quite a lot with Southport were there. Um, but yeah, it was a nice first experience of, of going to a game. Um, I played a lot of football. I was, I think... I always remember his question as a kid. I think I asked my own kids this recently. Where I'd say, "What do you prefer, playing or watching?" And I think my answer was always playing. So I would tend to yeah. I'd play for my my youth teams and went on to play at a decent level at, at youth level. Um, so yeah, I probably preferred playing to watching, really. Yeah, and that usually precludes you from going to the games because it would be on a Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Then. <clears throat> What I'm always fascinated by with commentators is when you you were watching early games, okay, so you didn't get to that many because you were playing, but you did get to the old one. Was there something inside you which went, actually, do you know what? I would quite like to be commentating in your head somewhere, commentating on this game. I mean, some of them have said from a very early age, uh, I mean, without being too rude, they're quite anal about things, quite nerdy. And begun to be, and I think that's a common trait amongst commentators. They love collecting facts. They love putting them in the right order, and and that then leads actually to someone being a very good commentator. So where where was that switch suddenly turned for you, where you went, I think this is something I want to do and I could do. I think I just love football, and that and that has sort of certainly come through into my adult life as well. I don't really remember thinking as a young a young person that oh you know, that's what I want to do although funnily enough I haven't got the greatest of memories I'll be honest I'm probably not the greatest person for this but uh, <laughs> my, no 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 Adam <laughs> come on you, you, you're absolutely fine we'll we'll dig it out of you we'll we'll get into the recesses of your brain yeah but I was um I posted something on Facebook a few weeks ago about a game and and a really really old friend from school days when I was that age about five or six they're on my Facebook and they replied and they said, oh, it's really nice to see you doing these sort of games. I remember when we were at infant school and you were sat cross-legged in assembly pretending to be a commentator. Well, I have absolutely no recollection of that. And it really surprised me because I thought, I don't really think, feel like I ever thought in those terms until I was much, much older. Like almost, you know, when I got to my latter years at high school, I remember thinking that I wanted to get involved in sports journalism, football reporting, but more on the print side of things. And it was only really um, when I did my work experience and I had a year out between 
um, college and university that I worked at a local newspaper and spoke to the journalists and they kind of really put me off, to be honest, and said, look, you really think hard before coming into print based journalism because it's a really hard slog. The pay is not good at all and you might want to try something else. So that was when I then had a bit of a rethink and thought, right, I'll go into the the broadcast side of things. But even then, it wasn't necessarily to be a commentator. It was more my my well not just my early years, a big chunk of my career in, in the media has been as a, as a news reporter, a radio news reporter. So, um, so, so the, yeah, that was where I, I sort of saw myself and then I was doing football on the side. And then eventually I thought, now this is, this is what I really want to do now. I really want to specialize in the commentary. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer that. I hope, I hope I have in some way. <laughs> No, no, no. You you covered it pretty well, I think. Um, and did you then go to uh, uni, Stroke College? To did you do a journalism course, or what was the course you went on? Yeah, I did. I did three years at Nottingham Trent Uni doing broadcast journalism. Yeah, so that that was what I did at university. I'd done an A level in media, and I did another in business. Um, what's the other one I did? Oh, English language, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so. They, they were the the A levels I did, and then yeah, did broadcast journalism at university, which was mainly news based, really teaching us to go out into the field and report for TV and radio, and yeah. sports stories included, not just news stories. But yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I loved my time at Nottingham Trent, and um, and then yeah, it gave me the hunger to go into the business. You, you tend to find some people don't actually end up taking a job in what they've studied it's quite common that at university yeah. but yeah I was always quite focused from that point that I really wanted to get into the media and, and into broadcasting. Talking about getting into broadcasting why don't we go to your first full commentary match which when you told me about it I looked into it and uh, it's quite a good start to uh, a broadcasting career because there was quite a lot happening wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. The, this was the day where I was really sort of bitten by the commentary bug, and I remember coming away from it um, and just thinking, "That is what I want to do." I, I've never felt a buzz like that ever doing anything, and that is what I want to do. And yeah, it was it was at Mansfield one hundred three point two, a local radio station, great little local radio station in in the Nottinghamshire area, um, where having got my degree I had to go back home initially just because I had no money basically but I'd met a lady who went on to become my wife who's now my ex-wife who um who I wanted to move back to be with and so I was desperate to try and get a job in Knotts I just couldn't get one I was struggling really struggling to even get an interview at places um and they I sent my CV there and it just so happened the boss there went to funnily enough went to the same college as me in Southport many many decades earlier and that okay. he noticed that on the cv and that was he says that's the only reason i phoned you <laughs> <laughs> so he phoned me and, and and basically i ended up i had a trial there and i got a job there and i just did everything there it was such a good ground in in the media and radio i just got thrown in at the deep end um worked in the newsroom did presenting did everything was there for three years and quite soon after i'd got there probably about a year in something like that they decided, I think, that it was costing them too much money to because they had a finite budget. And I think they decided it was costing them too much money to employ freelancers to do the football commentary. So they sort of said, oh, we think you might be decent at that. We'll give you, you know, we want to give you a go. So I, I, again, I just got thrown in at the deep end. The advice was, uh, I sort of, you know, searching for a bit of advice. And the advice was, um, would you, if you were hanging on to the edge of a cliff, would you let go? And I said, well, no, we said, well, just keep talking then. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that was pretty the good advice. advice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so that was the advice I got. But it was Cambridge against Mansfield Town um, at Cambridge, at the Abbey Stadium. I've still got a photo in my I've, my mantelpiece from that day, actually. Sadly, the guy was co commentator that with a uh, day with Steve Hartshorn, sadly passed away a few years ago. But I've still got that picture in a frame. Uh, and it was just absolute chaos. I, I love in games. I'm, I'm at my happiest as a commentator when it's just all chaos. I, that's why I, mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. And that's what that that game was like. Cambridge, um, as I say, got beaten 2-1 at home. Mansfield ended up finishing the game with nine men, as I remember. Um, I remember Keith Curl, almost like he was the Mansfield manager at the time, almost face to face with a policeman on the pitch at the end of the game. It was just, right. it was just, just crazy. Um, and obviously Mansfield won and I was covering it for a Mansfield station, which 
so you, you are you are pretty biased when you're doing it for a local radio station i guess so um nice. yeah it was just an amazing day i've got such good memories of that at the abbey stadium and the abbey stadium is for, by strange coincidence ali bruce ball's first game as a commentator oh no no his first game ever sorry attending was cambridge at the abbey stadium not against mansfield newport county Cambridge also lost 2-1. But his mum took him to his first game, although his dad was sports mad. He, he, he just, there was a Saturday, took him there. Uh, and we had quite a long chat about, you know, Cambridge, you know, it's quite a, it's a small, tight ground, the Abbey Stadium. But um, amazingly, in his first game, playing for Newport County was Tony Pulis. So there's another oh, wow. connection. Because... <laughs> Alice got worked to work. with Tony Pulis yeah, alongside yeah. him. So, yeah, it's 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 a common theme. So, yeah, when you actually look at this game, I mean, it's fourth tier, what's called the third division then. So there are two seven-minute sections of these in this match where everything went completely berserk. So yeah. 34 minutes in, Mansfield take the lead chap called Craig Disley, who we're going to come back to in a bit. Then two minutes later, Christie gets a second yellow sent off for Mansfield. Then six minutes later, Reese Day, straight red. So as you say, Mansfield won the up, but happened to be nine men. They managed to survive till half time. Then amazingly, in the 74th minute, they took a 2-0 lead. Yeah. Liam Lawrence, who went on to play for Stoke and Portsmouth, scored a penalty. Two minutes after that, Dave Kitson, who we all remember very well, got a red, and then yeah. followed up by, a couple of minutes later, Cambridge uh, scored through a guy called Fleming. So you've got these amazing two sections where literally, you know, there's more more going on in those two sections than in some games altogether. Yeah. So... When you were in that, and, and obviously it was your first game, so it's, it's quite difficult to remember, you know, as your common as a commentator, how do you process that? Are you just going, this is a crazy game, yeah. something yeah. weird's going to happen, or you just need to retain a little objective view. Okay, we've got another 60 minutes of this crazy stuff. How, how do you think? Because... You probably want a quieter game. I don't know as your first commentator, just to be able to the easiest way in. Well, you'd think so, but I have to say that I, I, I think that game was responsible really in so many ways for making me so determined to do the job that I've ended up doing because it's insanely competitive and you really mm. do have to work exceptionally hard to, to get, you know, to, to climb the ladder. And I just think the energy in uh, from that day and, and how it inspired me has just helped me so much in, in my career, really, when I think back to it. And I suppose now as a much more experienced broadcaster, sort of more than 20 years on, in terms of when there is the chaos, it's that fine balance of, of immersing yourself in that chaos, because that's what the people at home are doing. Uh, I always think as a commentator, you've almost got to be feeling the game the same as the people at home are, because if they can feel that you're enjoying it as much as they are, then, yeah. you know, I think that makes good commentary. I and mean, some people would disagree and say, oh, no, you've got to be very distinct and separate and very professional and whatever. But I think you can still be professional, but also just say, I am loving this. I'm going to throw myself into it. I'm just going to soak it all up and I'm going to run away with it. There are sometimes in a game where... Um, there's sometimes in a game where you might get lulls and stuff and you might be looking more at your notes and relying more on your notes and bringing in your co-commentator more. And there are sometimes in a game where you can just say, do you know what? It's almost like you metaphorically get those notes, rip them, chuck them up in the air and just go, come on, let's just go away with this. This is this is brilliant fun. And that's really what that game was like. So that was a great start for me in that respect. I, I have to say, I wouldn't like to listen back to the audio. <laughs> I, don't, I think it would sound really <laughs> ropey, to be honest with you. Um, but I just remember afterwards people saying, oh, you know, you'd, great, great first go and what a game you had. And yeah, I... I from that moment, as I say, the best way I can put put it to you is that I was really bitten by the commentary bug. And, and from that day, that was what I wanted to do. Because till that point, I had an interest maybe mm. in doing football reporting. So, you know, when you get, say, Five Live or Talk Sport, when they'll throw over to a reporter at the game and they'll do 30 seconds. Or, I kind of fancy doing that, but I'd never really seen myself as doing commentary until they 
basically Tony Delahunty, the boss there, pushed me into it and said, right, we wanted you to do this. And then I did it and I loved it. And as I say, from that moment, that's what I wanted to do. But until that point, I don't really think I saw myself as being a commentator, no? No. And Tony Delahunty, you remember, you, you, you recall him there, because obviously he was the man responsible for Darren Fletcher's career as well. So, yeah. and, and you told me earlier, he's still working, which sounds amazing. Tony is just an amazing man. He is a one-off. I mean, he's in his, he was telling me, he phoned me the other day actually to ask me to do something for him. And he's in his eighties now and uh, just exactly the same way that he was when he was in his sixties, when, when, when I was there, um, just a, a force of energy. He, he basically help basically runs the news desk there still now and gets great wow. local stories. And um, yeah, he's a, he's a fantastic guy and I owe him a lot. And I tell him regularly that, I've, you know, I thank him a lot for, for what he did for me. I got to see him actually recently at dinner celebrating the, um, I, can't remember, I can't remember how many years it was now the station's been around, but it was a, it was a, a birthday celebration for the radio oh. station, basically. And they invited me along and I gave, had a, bit, a big hug and a good chat with Tony. And uh, yeah, it was really nice to see him. But it's just so weird the way life works, as I say. I mean, he was very honest with me. He just said, look, I, I would never have phoned you if I'd not seen Cage, King George V College on your CV. So, you know, it's weird. Just weird how life works. It never ceases to amaze me, to be honest. Yeah. And going back to Ali Bruce Ball, actually, he his first... I think it was, he was at BBC Radio Bristol because he was at uni in Bristol and then moved on to doing some commentaries and reports. And his, his first report was actually Yeovil against Bishop Stortford and it was on Boxing Day. And he said he clearly remembers thinking, I'm going to have to make my mark here. I'm going to have to say something that's going to stand out. So he started his report. This is on Boxing Day. Yo ho ho for Yeovil, and he said he's never regretted something so much in his life because <laughs> it's out there. So I don't know whether you had something from your Cambridge Mansfield game which you think, oh, I I really want to bury that because I don't want to ever say. Is there something? Is there a commentator uh, glitch that you remember? I mean, you may not want to recall it, but you go. <laughs> Oh, I wish I hadn't tried to say that. I wish I hadn't, you know, um, pulled up something that is not really, didn't really work. Or is it all been plain sailing? Oh, no, it's not all been plain sailing. We all make mistakes. I certain, yeah. Certainly, mate, you, you can't do that job and do it for 20-odd years and, and not have the odds slip up occasionally with live TV, live radio. But I don't remember anything particularly like yo-ho, ho yo ho <laughs> like that. Um, but no, I mean... You, you do things that you think in your head at the time, you think that'll sound better than it actually did. I think everyone's been there and done that, no doubt. But yeah, uh, yeah and everybody's had... I remember when I was first starting out and um, not first starting out, but I'd been not long into it and I was covering Wigan at the time. And I remember making a mistake that wasn't probably looking back actually that bad, but I just got it in my head that I had to be pretty much perfect because I was trying to... Uh, it, you know, up against much more experienced broadcasters trying to work my up, up the ladder. And I thought, you know, I, I can't afford to make any mistakes. I remember making a mistake and I was so gutted afterwards. And I remember waiting with some other senior reporters down by the tunnel to interview the manager. It was Paul Jewell, I think, at the time. And one of those guys, because you, you get to know each other, don't you, when you're covering a, a patch. And one of them said to me, what's what's wrong with you? You know, you're so quiet. And I said, um, you know, I just explained and he went, he was much, much older than me. And he said, Adam, you can't get that down about that because believe me, you're going to make a lot more mistakes as you as you go through this business. And he was right, to be fair. And I'll probably say a similar thing now to to um, younger reporters. But yeah, you do try and, and be perfect, I suppose. But I think, you know, I think to somebody who's probably one of the most, if not the most famous commentator this country's ever produced, which is um, the motor racing commentator. Um, yeah. yeah. Murray Walker and and he was famous really because he wasn't perfect in some ways. I mean, he was yeah. a great comment, but it, it was his imperfections a lot of the time that people loved and enjoyed. And that was why they really embraced him because he wasn't always perfect in what he did. So I've always found that interesting as a commentator. I think sometimes I always thought as I was younger, I thought, oh, you can almost be, don't get, don't get me wrong. You don't go out to make mistakes, but I think sometimes you can almost be too polished. And that was something yeah. that I learned quite early on. Because I think, you know, when you're um, 
in the audience, either watching on television or listening on the radio and the commentators taking you through it, I think in a way you're right. You don't want it to be too polished because you've got to go with the ebbs and flows of the game yeah. and you are going to make the odd mistake, but that's a human thing. And as you say, we love Murray Walker's cock-ups. We, you know, Coleman balls, it was based on David Coleman, you know, so private eyes still run it every week where someone's made an error. And, you know, David Coleman is enshrined in the fact that he used to make quite a few errors and he's got his own bottom in private eye. So, you know, we, we love your slip-ups. We love your slip-ups. <laughs> keep, keep doing them, man. Keep doing them. Don't, don't worry about it. So now we're going to move on to another landmark for you as a commentator, which was your first commentary at Wembley. So you've gone from your first game at Anfield to the Abbey Stadium, which is quite a shift, we've got to say. And then <laughs> Abbey Stadium up to Wembley is another shift back up the um, up the ladder, let's say. I, I love the Abbey Stadium. I've been there a couple of times with my team, Crystal Palace, many years ago. And I did mention this before, very famous FA Cup quarter final, 1990, before we went on to beat Liverpool in the semi, beat Cambridge yeah. 1-0 at the Abbey. Um, sorry, Cambridge fans. Uh, but you're now going to Wembley and it's uh, 2016, so 13 years after that first commentary at the Abbey. Yeah. What struck you first about your Wembley commentary, your first Wembley commentary? It was just the best experience because I am a real football stadium geek. I'm a football geek. I just love football, all types of football, whether it be Italian or non-league football, Premier League, whatever. And I'd always had this ambition to commentate at Wembley. Um, it was just, it's just such an iconic place. And I can remember in the lead up to doing the game, how excited I was. And I think I arrived at Wembley that day. I think it was about five hours before kickoff. And I thought to myself, even for me, this is probably overkill. I don't really need to be here. But I was so <laughs> glad that I did because I spent the first sort of three hours, I think, two or three hours, just basically like looking around with my mouth open, you know, and, and walking around the... Um, underneath the stadium, walking down the halls where all, there's all sorts of pitches on the walls and stuff like that. And just absolutely just soaked it all up before I did the game. And it was just brilliant. And um, I'm, I go back there. Well, I do always, and while I've been at to BT and TNT, as it's now known, I've, I've done since then, I've done every uh, National League promotion final since. And I've not done every FA Trophy final, but I've done quite a few. So I've had many, many, many trips back there. And Myself and Adam Virgo, who I do nearly all those games with, we always say every year, in fact, he said it to me this year, the day that I find that I'm blasé about this, the day that I take this for granted, I'll know it's probably the day to do something else. Because still every time I go there and I walk down the tunnel, I walk out, get up to the gantry, I just get this such a buzz. And um, yeah, that day was just really special memory for me, that first game at Wembley, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so let's get into it. So it's the 25th of May, 2016. It's the National League playoff final. Um, so talk talk us through who, 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 who was playing, what was the score, what are your memories? Yeah, well, it was Forest Green Rovers who would have been trying to get promoted to the Football League for the first time uh, against Grimsby, who obviously are a big Football League club in terms of history in the Football League. Mm -hmm who'd had several near misses to get him back promoted. I'm trying to think how many years they've been in the National League. I think it might have been five or six off the top of my head. I'd have to check that. But um, they'd had several near misses, as I say, to get back up. I think I didn't do it, but I think they might have lost the previous year's uh, promotion final. I think they 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 almost definitely did. I, actually, yeah. I think they had sort of three or four players because they got knocked out of the playoffs. I, mean, I think they might have had four years in a row, yeah. failing at the playoffs. So this, yeah. you know, you begin to get the feeling you're cursed. So Yeah, exactly um, that. And that that was the feeling going into the game. And, you know, Grimsby are a very big club for that level. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine they, I don't know this for certain, uh, my memory's not good enough to remember this, but I would, I would have thought they would have brought probably in the region of about 30,000 fans, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, it was a quite a big crowd actually. Forest Green were supporters were very much outnumbered, but there were, I remember there being a, such a big pressure on Grimsby to win the game to get promoted because of the reasons I just mentioned. So that's something that sticks in my head because I had a similar feeling with Tranmere years later, 
Um, I think that was in 2018 because Tranmere mm. lost the previous year and then went up the yes. year after and they because they're a similar size club to Grimsby yeah. in terms of size of support. So, um, yeah, I just remember that all the pressure was on Grimsby and they went in front on um, just before half time. I think, in fact, they scored yeah. twice just before half time. Bogle, he went on to have a pretty good career in the Football mm-hmm. League. He scored. And then um, about an hour in, um, Keanu Marsh Brown scored one of the best goals I've ever seen at Wembley from miles out to make it 2 1. Right. And then it was pretty nervy, as I remember for a good while until added time when Nathan Arnold, who funnily enough had come through the youth system at Mansfield town when I was covering Mansfield town and he went to the same gym as me when I, when I lived in Mansfield, he went and uh, scored in injury time to make it three, one. And of course that was it. The job was done and Grimsby were promoted. So uh, yeah, even moments in the, particularly that Marsh Brown goal, he was a, I don't know if he's, I think he is still playing actually, but he was so talented. He was one of those guys at that level of the game where you'd watch him and you'd think, how on earth is he playing in the fifth tier? I mean, his technical ability was just ridiculous at times. But that you get those players like that at that level who, who sort of flit in and out of games, or you might see them one day and they're a nine out of 10, and you see them the next and they're a four. And he was maybe a little bit like that, but he still was better than the, that level and he went on to play in the league. Um, but that day, that goal he, he scored was unbelievable. If you People who've not seen it, go and have a look. It was such a good goal. But yeah, it was uh, Grimsby who went up.